Hello, Carson. Welcome to Medicine of Sound podcast. So happy to have you here, man. Hey, Chase. Yeah, good to finally finally join the show. Yeah, I invited uh, Carson out here, I think maybe close to a year ago, and we were going to do a podcast. Yeah. Um, and then we went for a hike instead. So we're back here now. And I feel like we have probably a lot more to talk about. There have been mm-hmm. a lot of ceremony since then, a lot of uh, integration and learning, you know? Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot's changed in a year. And I think we just needed to go for a hike that day. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So one of the things we were just speaking to, and I received a text from you. Um, do, you do you want to just speak to it, and we'll uh, we'll dive in? Yeah. Well, for sure. Let's jump right into it. Uh, you know, if I recall, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. We're we're just texting back and forth, and after having, oh, just like about a month ago, just such a transformational week of medicine experience up in Caslo, I I found myself. Uh, what seemed like a good integration three or four weeks go by but the interesting thing is like going back to a lot of the things I would do kind of pre-medicine some of the basic habits it's like the backlash of it Um, things that I I could get some forgiveness with around food or habits I felt actually extraordinarily worse than beforehand and I kind of started to cycle in my head of like man, I'm really sick. Like there's something wrong with me in my core. Like there's there's like some fundamental weakness of me. Mm. And and yet I'd notice at the same time if I was doing things that were really still in line with that kind of spiritual alignment, the, the effect, the positive effect was magnified. So, you know, you, you had a few words to kind of respond to that. Yeah, well, speaking to it off the draw, I'd say that the medicines are really good at amplifying our positives and our negatives. Mm. It shows the contrast more broadly and makes us more aware of it. Therefore, we have to be more responsible to it. Um, I don't remember what my response was, but it was probably something to the tune of that once we do medicine, and we get exposed to a different vibration or a different perspective and we become more aware, when we create the same uh, habit or we act on the same thing that we know we shouldn't do, after certain journeys, specifically certain journeys where we have been exposed to it and we see ourselves, if we go back to that same behavior, we will suffer. We will suffer more than when we hadn't had that experience. And there's a thing to be said as well where I don't think it's all, it always comes down to just um, doing medicine and having a realization. It's just the more you do medicine, and some people will probably be able to relate to that, is you automatically have more contrast of experience. And a lot of people will start telling themselves, I feel really ungrounded because they are not grounded within their practice of doing the actual integration, which is not just integrating exactly what you've learned, it's just integrating all of the positive things that you know you should be doing. And there's like parts of of working with Aya where we purge these energies out, and sometimes we don't even know what we purged out, Mm. but we purged out um, basically a part of like a, uh, an unawareness block. Mm-hmm. And now we're just naturally more aware. Did we get a download? Did we get an activation? Maybe it wasn't conscious. But now when we leave the ceremony, we're more conscious just automatically. And now we have to be more responsible. With great awareness comes great responsibility. And that's what unfolds. I know for myself, I'll, I'll give a little bit of my journey because I have not told this to many people at all. But when I was about 24, uh, was when I just began my journey being vegan. I had drank ayahuasca when I was 23, and I developed an eating disorder almost immediately. Mm-hmm. Probably part of it was I shouldn't have just jumped into being vegan so strongly and not know what I'm doing. I didn't study anything. I was eating like a lot of meat every day, and then I was just trying to figure it out swimming mm-hmm. upstream. And I developed an eating disorder where I was binging. I wasn't purging in the same way that you would think like uh, puking, but I would be binging because I was really low on calories. Like looking back, I was really low on calories, but I wasn't understanding that. And then what happened was I'd be starting to just binge on really heavy food. So if I ate like a little piece of chocolate, it would just be like, I want all the chocolate everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I would have that. And then what I would do, it's gonna seem really weird, is I just eat like a whole, Thing of sauerkraut and give myself 
diarrhea. And then I, so I would binge and purge, but I'd be binging and purging in a very weird way because I yeah, never would yeah. think of doing that. I was like, oh, I have all this chocolate in me. I need to get this out. Yeah. And it was weird because I developed that issue after the bunch of Aya journeys. And I remember looking back on it being like, how did I develop an eating disorder? This isn't this like backwards? Like what, what happened? But what it was exposing to me was my lack of awareness and lack of addressing something that clearly isn't working. So it doesn't always mean that you're going like, well, this habit of smoking tobacco or eating burgers is the thing I need to stop doing. It's when you're not looking or listening to your experience, you're going to develop uh, a massive uh, disorder so that you can address it. And those disorders are in service to our highest good. That's how I see it at, at least. And that's what my journey was. But when you're in the middle of it, it doesn't feel that way. It feels like I'm just lost because once you start getting into that disorderly state, you get used to doing all of these like terrible habits, which are which cycle themselves. You, you start be, uh, d developing a cycle where you're like, oh, you know, you didn't eat that much food these days. And then you ate some chocolate and you have this predisposition to just like binge it. And then you have a predisposition to be like, well, I can solve it by doing this. And then you just cycle, cycle, cycle. And uh, when you do that as well, you're not even actually absorbing those calories you just consumed. Sure, sure. So, you know, you, you, you know how it is. So, for myself in my own journey, it, it did get very messy and it got messy because I just didn't know what I was doing. And I think there's a probably echo of resonance in everyone's journey where there were things where we're like, oh my goodness, I just didn't know what I was doing. Because we are basically a population uh, or a humanity here, mankind of amnesia, just literally shooting in the dark, almost in regards to everything. Sure. and. The medicines just go, wake up, wake up, wake up. What's not working? Wake up, right? And and what the two things I, I like about what you said, one is it highlights the overall adaptive nature of our bodies and the universe itself when even a disorder is actually kind of nudging your needle forward in, in a positive direction. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I think is so important about what you're saying is there's, there's scores of people because of journalism right now, like, looking for psychedelics to cure everything in a really Western mindset. Mm. And this is sort of a, a an educated warning to, to people that it's th these aren't, you don't drink the magical brew and your anxiety and depression disappears. It's more like being invited on a journey of deeper attunement to yourself. Mm. And that's what I, you know, what you'd sort of responded with is, well, you know, when you're called to resonate with your soul in a deeper level, and then you, you're still kind of ignoring it in some way or, or distant from it, you're gonna feel that a lot more. Mm -hmm. And I just think, um, because me and, and, and my colleagues right now, we're in sort of, we're educating people who are very much from the mainstream and very pre-literate to psychedelics and this attitude uh, needs to be shifted a little in, in that this is an invitation to attune to messages that are there, mm -hmm. not just, this isn't gonna just fix everything, mm -hmm. you know? like. You, you could have easily been like, oh, I got an eating disorder. These things don't work hmm. with that really Western mind state. But it, it was different than that, right? It was different than that. And I feel like at the end of the day, when, when you watch the continuum of your life, you could probably look back and see that everything served. I had this horrible relationship, but in hindsight, I didn't make those mistakes again. So I learned, right? And for me, I, I feel like in my life, I didn't have... I don't know, like I had free reign with food when I, I was a kid and I would just eat tons of sugar and do all of these things. Yeah, so I yeah, think yeah. I was also still acting out an aspect of my childhood, which was like just this tyrant with sugar that needed to be purged out of me. And the purging of that uh, crazy sugar fiend addict uh, took its form of just like massively eating chocolate and then having guilt and then going through this whole process, right? Which. At the end of the day, when you look, I feel like if you look back on everything that's ever happened, it's like, oh yeah, that, that taught me this and that taught me that. And one of the things that the medicine will do sometimes is if we're in the middle of having an issue with something, it can show us, hey, this is what you're doing, this is not working, but it's not gonna force its way into your experience like uninvited, you know? If you're not willing to address something, it won't address that thing, mm -hmm. you know? So there's, it's a dance. And and what, what I say, you know, usually is like, we're embarking on a relationship and that relationship yeah. is, it's a stern, uh, 
being that is basically exposing you to yourself. You know, it's a teacher. So if you have a if you have a teacher and that teacher is like, hey, this this person's got this tendency. You know, I can't just call out all of their tendencies all at once. We're gonna call them out slowly, bit by bit, right? And if you're if you're a good teacher, you'll take your time and be like, okay, this person seems willing to receive this right now, right? So, um, yeah, at, at that time, I feel like I was, you know just needed to go through that that's all like it's there's there's no like it did this and therefore that it's just like i needed to experience that i needed to get that sugar demon out of me somehow yeah well it's a it's a really positive orientation to kind of whatever happens uh my question is what do you you know there there's a a gentleness of not getting too much of the message at once like Mm. and kind of destabilizing so what do you think of this kind of difference between folks really in the camp of have deep experiences take a lot of time to integrate where others are just like more medicine the better let's put sananga and hape and and combo all kind of in the same night and and marathon how do you how do you kind of make sense of this difference in some people's more is better attitudes uh well first of all i think there's uh the thing that came into my mind was different strokes for different folks right mm-hmm. and there's there's a different there's not going to be a one size fits all i know for myself um coming from a very rigid tradition they were you know anti-cannabis anti this anti that basically anti-guitars and i come from a place of following the rules so i mm-hmm. followed those rules massively and then I started to just see that life is a choose your own adventure. And for some people, this is the thing, like they're getting their addictive tendencies out. They're getting their more more monster out of them. I always say that at the end of the day, what drugs are you choosing to use? Because there are some drugs that no matter how much hape you do, it's gonna be relatively benign. If you change that over and start putting cocaine up your nose, well, you know, we've got a massively different, there's a leaps and bounds of a chasm of differentiation there. And we've got even psychedelics, you know, you can only do them so many times. If people's idea of a good time is to do mushrooms repeatedly back to back to back for days on end, they're gonna put that one away pretty soon. But if they're deciding to use meth, like this could just keep going, you know, people can just subject themselves to intensity, you know? So I I think at the end of the day, there's a lot of people in the plant medicine community that have addictive tendencies. That's probably partially what brought them there and it's exposing it to them, but still they're getting to get it out of their system while using more benign substances than some of the ones, even pharmaceuticals, you know, like depending on what you're using it for. I, but this is the thing, I used to have massive judgment to people that were smoking cannabis every day and doing this thing every day. And at the end of the day, I don't have judgment towards that. I definitely don't think you should be doing pretty much any substance every single day. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, that's up to you. That's up to you to experience. And for the people that are taking a really long time to integrate, there can be a couple factors there. There can be that their lifestyle does not uh, offer them the opportunity to attend more often, whether that is financially, whether that's because they have children, whether that's because of them only wanting to get a little bit at a time. But a lot of people, this is the thing, they'll be seeing the ceremony as this idea that they're getting to do this thing, which is a miracle. So if you treat it as a miracle, I think that's a really beautiful thing. Mm. But it can also be very limiting because once you engage on this, uh, this path, I feel like in my experience, consistent consumption is, once you embark on this path, if you are serious, consistent consumption as little as possible not microdose not microdose not saying that i'm not i'm not really a big fan of that Mm -hmm. but if you need it because you're transitioning from pharmaceuticals or something take it but like if you're thinking that that's going to be doing something in relation to you learning and growing about yourself you need to have i believe at least a threshold dose of actually feeling something pretty strongly um and strongly is in quotations because that's gonna be different for people but 
yeah, I think that people should really uh, be having an experience with it and consistently using it as a practice. And the reason why I say like do as little as possible because um, it can be taxing on your body and yeah. it can be taxing on your mind and you also don't want to bite off more than you can chew. You don't want to be scared away from the path. There's all of these reasons to keep it light but keep it very serious. Like you treat it as a container for growth, right? So. Um, not sure. I feel like I went on a tangent there. <laughs> hey, tangents are, are good. We're, we're, we're pro tangent. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, I had one that just I wanted to speak to in this topic of mm -hmm. in integration and, and it's around surrender and, and versus control mm. and maybe to some degree even sort of feminine intuition and kind of masculine solar will. We, we don't have to label it that way, but, eh, but uh, it, yeah. yeah, I, for, for me, just in, in when I was young, like to overcome just a lot of what was beyond control in my family and just kind of the, the complicated, troubled genetics on both sides, I discovered in my mid-teens and forward, I could control the world through my intelligence and I get good results and I could go to college and I get scholarships and it would make, it would, things would be better with, with my parents. And so this, this served me so well, this, this, this kind of manipulating and controlling the environment. And what the tricky part of integration now is, um, the medicine seemed to give me just an experience of, of surrender, of letting go of the very tool that's like, that has uh, it's served me so much, it's generated so much. Mm. And so I kind of dialogue with that part. It's like, you know, if anybody's heard of internal family systems or parts work, you can kind of talk to your inner parts and you can actually like have a relationship with your, your sub-personalities. But as I talk to that old controlling part and um, have these experiences of really surrendering into uh, flow and letting things happen. I found myself after just a deep like DNA scrub of medicine earlier this year, kind of have pendulating too far into, into, into surrender. So I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts around finding the balance of like the, the striving, doing, will, controlling the world versus sort of surrendering into, into a kind of a flow state and, and like, a, you know, just really contacting and allowing things to happen and, and even kind of become manifest. Yeah, I feel like it's a weaving. I don't know too much of the Eastern spirituality, like kind of Shiva Shakti thing, but um, from what I've understood, the Shakti path is kind of like the surrender, kind of like this feminine, you know, mm -hmm. um, and and it's all about how we're accessing the, the divine, right? And how we're accessing spirit. And you can surrender into it, or you can kind of intellectually drive yourself to, towards it, um, intellectually, energetically, em emphatically, whatever, right? There's like an expressive and there's just a letting go. But the ultimate teaching, which is what I've understood at least, and anyone correct me if I'm wrong, because I could be wrong about lots of Eastern spirituality stuff. I haven't studied it for about a decade, but I remember Osho specifically saying that at the end of the path, they are the same. They meet at the same place. So what he would explain from what I remember was that you basically use 100% of your effort to surrender. And through complete surrender, you have complete control. So at the end of the day, they meet at the same place. But where we're weaving at right now, which I feel it too, is there's a continual back and forth between, okay, I'm feeling more control. Like for me, I'll feel like this masculine power force flood through me and I am on like a mission. I feel like I'm going out to war sometimes and I'm like going through my days and then like right now I'm going through an absolute surrender and I'm just like surrendering to what the day is is calling for, right? Um, but if I didn't have that part of and that flow, right, which sometimes they've been three month spurts, four months, sometimes six, sometimes one month and a burnout, depending on how I approached it, you know? Um, but what, what I find ends up happening is all of the things I've been cultivating through my willpower, I can then surrender into. And I feel like this weaves very well into, we were, we were just talking about uh, the Huberman Lab podcast, and he speaks to the different types of like, uh, 
states that we can get into when we learn something. I don't remember what he was referring them to. I'm really bad at the l lingo here, but the the way that we learn something, it'll either be kind of like on autopilot or we have to focus at it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like those are a very similar description of sometimes you gotta go and you're gonna like, like let's use uh, playing the guitar, right? Right now I'm learning a new song. While I'm learning the new song, I have to have that masculine force present, right? Of like focus, determination, willpower, breaking through frustration, and then once it's learned and I have it on autopilot, I can surrender into it. And I, I feel like that just that description hopefully resonates and makes sense to everything. Is that the end yeah. goal is, I feel like, surrender, but surrendering into a place where we've already cultivated that which we want through our dopaminergic response to reality, which is like, I want to get this, and then I get that and then I surrender into the thing that I got. The, in Eastern spirituality, very often they're, you know, from what I was experiencing, they're very anti in pursuit of things, which is interesting because my name is Chase and that literally means to be in pursuit of. And I feel like through my experience that to weave that as well, to be in pursuit of things, and then when you're in pursuit of things and you accumulate things and or you accumulate skills, then you rest and you you uh, enjoy that and you enjoy it. it's like a plateau you know you can think of it as going to the gym you like hustle really hard you get to these new gains and then you just let yourself stay there for like one year six months whatever you feel called to um, I do feel like there we have to do both we don't have a choice mm -hmm. so people that are always in this masculine oriented mind they will burn out or they will uh, ultimately yeah, they'll just burn out well, that, it, it doesn't matter you know? this this is what we talked about before putting the camera on is this like this idea of pendulating between alternating states yes, yes. and I, I love this because I, I think similar to you, I think this is a universal principle mm -hmm. that that's just how things work and what you spoke to on the topic of burnout I, uh, I actually found a definition out in Castle that I really liked of toxic masculinity. Like I found a term that really I appreciated and it was the excessive, relentless use of it without ever pendulating back into surrender and trust mm. and the kind of feminine principle. And I did that so wonderfully, horribly for, for all of my 20s uh, to the point where my, my sense of will and overcoming, just like imbalance of solar energy, uh, just powerlifting, insomnia, push further and further, <laughs> work hard constantly. It it that was just all I knew. That was my survival mechanism when I was young. But uh, I, I somebody termed that as toxic masculinity because it was just I had formed this body armor over myself, mm. this like intellectual shell that people were seemed to both like but be kept far away from. Mm. And it was like the level of cortisol in my body all the time mm. from not getting the the. Oh, ever <laughs> was just, and, and you know, so some of those early experiences of really finding ceremony again back in, in, in 2016, oh, right, tuning back into the somatic. Um, but what, I, I just want to give a few examples of kind of where we see pendulating. You referred to the Huberman research. He talks really a lot about the, the focused attention and then the diffuse attention. Mm. And we know from creativity, the idea is you, you want to grasp an idea and really focus on it, um, search for the answer analytically, and then let it go. And then in, in your kind of limbic system and beyond in the unconscious mind, the answer will tend to come in a mm. passive manner. Mm. And then you've got it, and then you focus back in with, with attention. You kind of manipulate things, then you let go. And what a bloody good metaphor for the kind of principle of life. and. Mm. And uh, another person I think you'd, you'd love to check out is Ian McGilchrist, who, who wrote one of the most impressive books I've ever seen, The Master and His Emissary. Mm -hmm. It's this incredibly ambitious, unifying neuroscience that talks about the left and right hemispheres, and it just mirrors that structure of the universe. And the idea being the right hemisphere kind of sits in this totally expansive meditative open flow experience then it passes things over to the left hemisphere that puts it into boxes, analyzes and codes and has linear logic. Then it passes that back to the right brain, which then generates a new big picture and it just alternates again and again. And mm. you see 
people get kind of ill when they're when they're um, biased to one side. Like you see it just even sort of the Taoist principles of, of like chaos and order. There's an imbalance when people get kind of stuck, I think, too much and they're just not pendulating anymore. Mm -hmm. And I can really speak to somebody Actually, to everybody that comes to our, our clinic downtown seems to be stuck in left brain analysis, clinging, grasping, and never pendulating back into that surrender state, that, that sort of rest, mm. recover, nourishing, restoration of the cells. Mm. And I, th I think you're right. Like the, the beautiful part is at the end of the, you know, when you beat the game, you know, they, they, were, they were the same thing. Like, you know, they were a part of the same principle at the end. Mm -hmm. It reminds me just of duality and everything in this reality is is dual in, in its essence. And through the the bouncing back and forth is how we, we learn. You were, were speaking to also just like your gung-ho nature and you built up all of this like armor through that, that process. I feel like the thing to ultimately understand for everyone is we can get really excited by something. So like, let's say me, you know, I got these cameras, microphone, I'm filming, it feels really good. And then you get into this place where you can overdo it. And you're just feeling like, ah, uh, like, I'm just not just, I have you ever why. overdone it? Yeah, on everything, <laughs> on everything. Yeah. yeah. And what we see here is that everything serves us until it doesn't. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't serve us, just doesn't right now, right? And and there's people that jump to conclusions as well. So you can probably see that in the polar opposite experiences, people are stuck in this like trying too hard, working too hard, too, too much, like grinding cortisol. And then when they finally relax, maybe, they jump to all of these conclusions. Like I need a new relationship and I need this and I need that and I need space and I need to go to Costa Rica and just like chill, right? And these are like kind of o like overcompensations. And when we see that there are these like mass decisions made, I'm not saying like for some people that's what they're supposed to do and that's to totally cool. And some people will be stoked on that forever. But most people, when we start making like big decisions because especially when we realized something we go whoa mm. it's because we were just in an imbalanced state and whatever we were doing like working really hard uh, i just have to say you know for anyone that's like hey you know I'm, I'm about the like meditation life i go about my day i work i eat food and i chill it's like that's cool um i still hope you're working really hard because at the end of the day humanity since forever has worked really hard. And it's, I feel like one of the biggest things that is the issues with, with people is that they have an aversion to hard work. Hard work doesn't mean lifting a bunch of heavy weight. It doesn't mean, you know, constantly being on the computer doing one task. Hard work means that you are constantly in a motion that serves you, mm -hmm. right? And that motion can also be rest because if you've moved to rest, that is rest in motion. It is intentful rest, right? And we we get we can get into this space where we're orchestrating our day, where everything that you're doing essentially is work, but you can surrender into that work because you have breaks and you have rest and you have all of these things that are interweaved to create the life that you actually want to live. Hopefully, you know, if everything that you're doing is something you don't want to do, it's a topic for another time. But um, at the end of the day, I think there's like a, a massively important thing to be said about just, just making sure that you're orchestrating your day in a way that is, that is surrendered and in flow and ultimately really hard work as well. And that's the weaving. That's the weaving of both sides. It's like both sides require that to, to harmonize with each other. Um, I think, you know, there, I'm sure you've probably heard this, but the Zen philosophy or um, Zen master was asked, what did you do before you were enlightened? I chopped wood and carried water. And then what do you do after? Mm -hmm. Chopped wood and carried water, right? And like both of those things he mentioned were work. He didn't mention not work, right? And and I know Zen, they, they meditate a, a, a lot, but that's also their form of work as well and this is the thing like it, it is work to get to the place that we want to get to um is not going to be sitting and loafing around right so um yeah. well there's a thin line between surrender and flow and avoidance mm -hmm. that was another thing we're speaking to is like 
the consequences of avoidance of uh, you know one has to check in I think and, and really see am I am I living a chill lifestyle or am I avoiding difficulty because mm-hmm. like I you know I, I love speaking about these polls like even though my last couple months have really been valuing the intuitive feminine element of surrender I'm, I'm remembering that 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 principle of walking into something that's really challenging and letting it activate you to your fullness let it express parts of your DNA that wouldn't if you just lived in a stayed on the couch and you know played PlayStation for just the rest of your life um, you know we see it in in the massive popularity right now people have with with heat and cold like the sort of let's stress out the system mm. so how do we use every sort of moment of challenge ahead of us as a call to action to step in as like a, a mini hero's journey that can make us more of more of who we are mm. and how do we not do it so excessively because my problem is I became so obsessed with Joseph Campbell's in the cave you fear is the treasure you seek. I just walked, I just would be in every scary cave all the time until I, I, I was sort of, you know, beaten into the ground. Mm. So, you know, it, again, how do we find ourselves just in that mm. balance spot of challenge myself and no one to call it quits? Right? Mm-hmm. Well, I think everyone's going to be really, really different on, on that. And I think your predisposition to be doing hard work just goes to show the opposite is true of someone that's chilling around all the time they gotta integrate some more hard work you gotta integrate some some more chilling right and like there's a there's a funny thing because what happens as humans is we end up hanging out and vibing with the people that are similar to us whereas one of the greatest things we can do is find someone that's a contrastingly opposite person and hang out with them and be like oh man this guy just chills all day all right this is going to be my chill friend yeah. and this is the thing right you got some friends you do this with you got some friends you hike with some friends you record videos with you know sometimes um, a friend you go for a hike with and then do a video, and then do with. A video with yeah yeah can you, can, you can have multiple things yeah. but yeah i i could not picture us however um sitting and watching a, um, a movie and just shooting the shit like i I feel very weird like it would just weird. Weird. Yeah. and I, I like a good movie but it was just something would just seem odd about yeah that. yeah yeah and like i at the end of the day I, I don't actually have a lot of friends that i i chill with but i feel like if someone is having trouble chilling ch- having someone that is a very chill friend will help them i don't actually have trouble chilling like i'm i actually um my partner she says she's like yeah you like you rest a lot you like there's there's a very well integration of rest but that's only because prior to me working very hard i was the chill guy so i'm the chill guy that just does nothing and then finally started to work really really hard only like mm. a couple of years ago like oh, i've only wow. been working okay. hard for like a couple of years yeah I, other than that i was just like i'm gonna do the bare minimum that, that life asks of me and i'm gonna just focus on myself and my own internal journey but that what that brought me to was it can only take me so far by being the chill guy i need to create more um taxing to my nervous system and i need to create more responsibility externally and internally to get to the next level of my journey at least where where i'm trying to go and um it just became very obvious to, to me i was like oh wow this is this can only get me so far. Like, I feel like I've maxed it out, you know? I spent all of my 20s pretty much being this very chill, meditative, zen kind of dude. And then it was like, okay, I started getting into entrepreneurs and, uh, and I saw this contrastingly opposite thing that I found was really beautiful. I was like, this is, this is the energy I want to embody now because they've got stressors that I don't. And those stressors I can see is helping them grow. And I want that, right? So... Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to picture because I've kind of known you just over the, the yeah over the last couple, couple of years, years yeah. yeah since I've been hustling yeah yeah but it's just isn't it just such a testament to the change the medicine for one person isn't for someone else and yes I've yes. I would I used to fifteen and younger I had a laziness about me like I, I I was creative but oh man I was lazy and it was later in life where I would start to really think man that was a skill that laziness <laughs> was the aspiration to to find my laziness right yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, lazy. Maybe I'm using a kind of uh, loaded term, you know, I mean, there's a better one, but uh, there was like a guilt free. I'd get bored. And then from, from my late teens later, I'd get restless instead of boredom. Mm. And, uh, you know, if you go down the rabbit hole, really what the switch was, um, 
before I had a conscious relationship with medicines, I was as a teen taking them to, to try to sort of escape. Mm. Till one night I took uh, seven grams of, of, of mushrooms with uh, in a bad setting. Uh, and uh, it was, you know, I hadn't processed any of that kind of divorce trauma, let alone ancestral dread I didn't know I had in me. I mm. wouldn't know for many years later. And it, it, it resulted in a, uh, an unwanted ego death, mm. like a, um, a, a unity experience that I resisted with everything I had. So it turned into a kind of a hell. Mm. And then, uh, then, I, then, the, then I got uh, a police officer tasered me a couple times. And because I like... I already thought I was in eternal hell. It was the Catholic hell for some reason. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's from my grandma, I, I think. I, already, I didn't know I was being tasered. So like the, the electric shock and thinking it would go forever, it was such a impossibly horrifying experience. And then the hospital, they aborted it with uh, benzodiazepine. So I didn't even finish the sequence of whatever was kind of working through me. Mm. And my personality was just different after. Mm. I, it, it became very type A. Uh, I was getting crappy marks in high school. Then I went to college and I started getting all A's. So it was, uh, I, I lost my laziness or like my, my centered rest. Interesting. But I found my strategy to struggle against the uncontrollable ultimate nature of what the cosmos are was I'll be real smart. Mm -hmm. I'll be so smart I, I can outsmart my mortality and my limited humanity in a mm. sea of internal consciousness experiencing itself. No, I will be my ego through firm intelligence. Mm. And it served me until mm, it just, just stopped. And, and, uh, and so for me, the prize is actually rediscovering, I could call it something different than laziness, but it's a, a, an existence without in intellect as the driver. Mm -hmm. And I've been less intellectually fascinated lately and, mm. and just trying to sort of see, well, how else is there to orient to reality <laughs> besides all the $10 words and everything? It sounds like what you had was a massive overcompensation for what you were prior. So it's an interesting because I had a very similar thing, but in a different way. So my, I didn't have this type A aspect. I had, uh, so during in my entire high school, I never read one book and I basically did all the easy classes. I just did nothing. And I've never done any post-secondary anything. But what I started to do when I was 20 is I started reading books. And when I started to read books, that was when I quit doing drugs. So I quit, I'm like doing all my party drugs, party phase was done. But I read my first book. My first book that I ever read was The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. Oh, yeah. Classic. Yeah, and it got me very interested in like, whoa, there's something in this for me. I'm having this experience through books that I had never had before because I'd never read a book, like literally. Like it was, I couldn't even focus, probably had ADHD, ate too much sugar, was affecting me massively. Then when I started reading books, I had the same thing though, where I wanted to be the smart person. Mm -hmm. I never wanted to be the smart person before. I just didn't care. I was just, well, I didn't even didn't care. I just thought being smart was, didn't care about that. I was like, I don't care. Was, yeah, yeah. Was, like, what about, do we have to do that? <laughs> yeah, I don't. I really don't care if someone's smart. It doesn't matter to me. And then I started to see though. This is the interesting thing through being a guy or just being a human is that people respect you a whole lot more if mm. you have something good to say. Mm. And that became like a drug, you know? And I see that probably very similar w with you, we, our, our self-worth was a absolutely amplified. This is the thing, like at the end of the day, how many chill people are gonna be respected in our society and how many type A's are gonna be respected? It's like, women, society, jobs, everything. It's type A bound, you know? It's like this is what the society is built around. And it should be, but it also should be acknowledged that that does not create balanced individuals. And I don't know, I just see that we, we have a mirroring there, absolutely. How old were you when you had that experience? Uh, 16 or 17. 16 or 17, yeah. So yeah, I was, I was yeah. more around 20 when I was trying to be smart, but it was still like a similar, similar-ish time frame where th at that point though, I wasn't type A. I, I was type A in the sense of spirituality. I was like absorbing mm. spiritual content like a, a drug addict. Like it was like in my veins, like watching videos every single day, probably spending eight hours a day either watching videos or studying different forms of spirituality, whether it was between, yeah, just Osho, books, whatever. Um, 
But I realized that as well through that experience from myself was that could only get me so far in the sense that I was relying on an external person to tell me something. Right? And I do believe that there's um, a very beautiful process that happens through that, through giving your power away, especially if that source of information is only trying to give you your power back. That's beautiful. But it was, um, it was a very interesting time for me to like just be like completely addicted to books, from going addicted to drugs to addicted to going to the gym and books. And then completely, basically, I don't even know if I've read one book since, and I read probably two to 300 books in three years. And then I just didn't read another book. I was like, I'm actually just gonna listen to my own experience because that's what every book has ever told me to, to do, essentially, you know, it's like, yeah, so. I really relate to that because after that uh, experience of, well, there, with no religion in my family or spirituality, I had no orientation for eternity and I got faced with it. I was like, well, that's a bummer. And, but I did find the Tibetan book of living and dying. Mm. And what, what I just kind of connect to is I became a ferocious consumer of books on Buddhism. But I also was, I spent hours and I was reading about meditation without cultivating a practice of actually contacting inner space. And I just did that for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And it, was, it, would be, it would be years until I actually started noticing the answers weren't on page 87 mm -hmm. and like they were in there. And then I'd forget that. And actually on that, one thing that I, I don't know if I find this funny or, or depressing, but I'll check old journals and like last week I'll have had just like this insightful realigning epiphany. But then I'll find a journal from when I'm 18 and I, I've had that epiphany. I'm like, really? <laughs> really? How, How humbling. Yeah. yeah right? Very humbling. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That's about, amazing. About the kind of limits, but uh, yeah. I've read some of my ramblings because uh, you know, when I was going through my process, when I first did I, I had a bunch of just, I was just automatic writing all of this stuff. And, uh, mm, and really. what I'm reading, I'm like, man, like we, we must repeat the same lessons over and over in a different way because life brings us different experiences. So sure, you can speak the word forgiveness and have a, a comprehension of forgiveness or an understanding for your, <coughs> your past in relation to your current experience. But now how about, you know, you hitting your betrayal wound in this experience? You're like, oh, well, that was very different. I had a lot more invested. I, there's a lot more time behind this this one, right? And uh, yeah, I, I just see that we are, we are on a like, repetitive loop. We will revisit the same things. And at the end of the day, we know we've repeated them because we notice it. If we don't notice it, it's a thing. If I don't notice someone betrayed me, it's because there's no betrayal wound left. Because there's no, there's the, does the, it, it will still happen. But if there's no response to it within me, there's means there's no. Sure, it's cleaned left. out. Yeah. Yeah. It's and this is kind of the relationship that happens. Is people will sometimes their version of spirituality will be oh. At some point, bad things won't happen to me because I will attract only good things. It's like, no, you will not care if the, the bad, th bad things happen. These are just, this is just life. It's like, it's just life unfolding and people's decisions, if you see it as their own, their free will is, they, I want them to do the thing that they want to do. And if they want to prioritize themselves over me uh, in that way, actually, that's a good thing. They, I want them to do that. And mm. I want it to be exposed to me so I can also learn to prioritize my life in a good way. Mm. And like, ultimately, life is just an unfolding of understanding, greater understanding. Mm. It's like, can I understand myself better? Can I understand people better? Can I understand this unfolding? Or we can go the opposite way and start judging and become callous and cold. And you know, it's, it's, it's a choose your own adventure, right? Yeah, we come back to that. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, how how long do we got here? I don't know, Chase. That was good. That was good, man. That was yeah. really good. We got uh, 43 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's uh, summer here in old Canada, and uh, it's it's quite it's quite warm. So Canada is known as the hottest country. Yeah, yeah, especially to Bra people from Brazil. Like they would definitely be like thinking oh, we're big time, big time hot. Our summers, man, they get up to like 30 degrees, guys. <sighs> <laughs> it was actually just recently 44 here, but it's it's not that today. It's 44 here, like in, not inland. Oh yeah, it's here. Yeah, oh, it was here. Geez, yeah. yeah, it was really hot. Yeah, there was something. We just uh, my uh, a good friend of mine went. I'm I'm taking like a medicine break to just like integrate in nature, and and we went 
a three day backpacking and we got in there and it was like it's very smoky like our eyes are burning we can't see very far and then we just we hiked deep in to the mountains we're like oh we're not seeing anybody in here there's nobody anywhere and we're just like ah oh, we thought we kind of we were like yeah we won because we have the space to ourselves but when we got back we were hung over like mm, just from breathing smoke for three days smoke. even being out in yeah, nature yeah. so uh you know this that that ends the debate forever <laughs> breathing smoke is really bad for you man i i find uh, yeah we've got lots of fires here as you can tell he's speaking to them but they're uh the fires when it's peak here and it's smoky in the sky and you can't really see the sun too too well is i feel like my head is just like i it's as if i've just eaten really bad foods for a long time and i was so much brain fog i'm like i can't even think right now it's so so trippy start going into a a daze but yeah i i would definitely say fires are bad if if um i i totally agree yeah i i think if what i said is if the fires continue every year like they have been i will not live here indefinitely but they have not been as bad this year as what was it two years ago i think it was it was hectic it, it was it was like almost half the summer was like smoky even here yeah like kind of you know it get go inland it's bad like i have family in the okanagan but yeah, it's so, tough. But I, I'm glad we agree that fire and smoke. Are fire bad. and smoke are bad. Don't, don't start forest fires. Smokey the bear said something about that, he right? Yeah, He's yeah. the wise Zen master we were speaking of today. Yeah, so. yeah. So on yeah. that, on that Smokey the bear note. Yeah. Thanks for coming, man. Yeah, and uh, we will, we'll have a conversation again. If you guys enjoyed that, like, comment, subscribe. Let us know. Ask some questions. We love vibes. See you again. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Sweet, man. Yeah.